One of the reasons why there is so much inaction and so much delay in government, so much delay in government, is the kind of atmosphere that we have that the best decision is to the for the chief of the United States. Police officer because the wireless system doesn't work. I'm not defending that. All I'm trying to say is every decision is wasted, every action is suspect, every no cheat can be distorted, every <coughs> government order can be questioned on its motives. To some extent, but I do not understand the theory of lies anymore. I understand. To the debate around transparency in governance has got shrill. Some would say it was a needed corrective, and India would find its balance somewhere. That we went from a period of entrenched corruption, so you needed that level of noise to bring back the trade. We three television studios and Cairo courts. I, I agree with that. I'm personally extremely uncomfortable with that trade in television, but I cannot accept that it can become the basis for jeopardizing the lives of Indian citizens. That's the only dis the disagreement. Very taken to that level of In that chapter, did you correctly understand the character of the Naxalite? Understand the character of the Naxalite leaders. They have held women as slaves and captives. Their children study in the best schools. That they kill and shoot and uh, commit all kinds of depredations. For what? For bringing about an overthrow of the established system of government. Have you heard President Obama yesterday? Yes. What he spoke about terrorism, but maybe not on that. Uh, that does not take away from the reality of terror. It does not take away from the reality of foreign funding for this terror, whether in Naxal uh, terrorism or in Jammu and Kashmir. But it does not. It does not mean. Now, you seem to think that development can take place before the people who can bring about development can even enter that area. No doctor can go there, no nurse can go there, no teacher can go there. You build the school, they blow up the school. You build the road, they mine the road. Therefore, it's not the first step, first to secure the place before we have 282. The highest number we had is 201. But you were, you were stopped by your own colleagues in the cabinet and by Mrs. Gandhi. No, I'm not who taking... Who had a much more extreme no. version of the view you think I have. I don't think so, I don't think so. I'm not taking any names. The point I'm making is that opinion on these issues will always be divided. But eventually, one has to take, as you said, a leadership position. You have to. I, I, I don't think Mr. Rahul Gandhi likes me either. I'm, I'm in a very special position. I have, I, I have managed Mr. to piss off Mr. Modi and Mr. Rahul Gandhi. We're talking about Isn't Mr. Isn't that Modi. A, I'm an equal opportunity offender? No, it is not. We're talking about Mr. Modi. That there are only two journalists who were not invited to the uh, tete a tete with the Prime Minister. One of them being you. And the other was Rajdeep. The other was Rajdeep. Yes. So, uh, Rajdeep Shah. Yes. What I think that he, is, he has a capacity for being more of a pragmatist than a polemicist. I think we've seen that in his Pakistan <coughs> policy. What his rhetoric was is very different from the policy he pursues today. And I believe that he will. On Twitter, you think I'm a biased anchor right now. <laughs> and here you say that while Mr. Modi doesn't like me, one of the common things that has happened to our politics, uh, you know, I, I, I do want to make this point to you, Mr. Chidambaram, is that politicians have found a way of talking to people bypassing mainstream media. And that applies to Mr. Modi, but it also applies to the Gandhi family, it applies to many other politicians. And I believe that that's very dangerous for our democracy. I, I don't want to push you further. I know that um, the government is here to stay for another 40 months and uh, you perhaps will. 40 months. months. And after that? <laughs> well, after that there will be an election. And you believe the result will be different? I believe we are a democracy. <laughs> I want to ask the final question. Yes. You talk about...
I wouldn't, I would say I'm upper middle class economically, but I would say in my values, I am upper still middle class is upper middle, middle class, class or as upper middle class as I define upper middle class. <laughs> I don't know how you define it. I said even the very rich call them No, upper I'm certainly nowhere close to any, I, I, you know, I, when I entered journalism, my salary was 8,000 rupees a month, and I know... In my first brief, I, I got 150 rupees. Right. <laughs> okay, yeah, so that was, I have the box, we have the box, yes. And I'm just going to read out a brief passage to set the stage for our conversation. This is from my book. In today's India, the millennial generation has thrown up what I call the new rebels. Young women are embracing things that were once taboo, or words that are typically used as pejoratives against them, and converting them into provocative statements of power. So whether these are slut walks or slogans of equality scribbled on sanitary napkins that are now plastered across campus walls, the urban feminist in India is looking for a fresh idiom to express herself with. The clash between the old feminism and the new was reflected in the cultural debate triggered by the Nirbhaya rape. On one of my shows soon after the Delhi rape, veteran actress Shabana Azmi and the much younger star Priyanka Chopra got into a raging argument over what Hindi films call the item number. While Indian society remains puritanical and closed when it comes to talking openly about sex, the portrayal of women in popular culture is now hypersexualized like never before. Is the formal advent of the item girl in Indian films a flamboyant serenade extraneous to the plot and inserted just for its in-your-face sexuality? Is it a sign of emancipation or another manifestation of the male gaze? Shavana believed it was the latter and called for women in the industry to make informed decisions about songs that were sexualizing even little girls who would then repeat the pouty lyrics at weddings. But look at the lyrics. Did women really want to be referred to as Tanduri Murgi or Chitni Chameli? Priyanka argued that it was all about choice and that free choice was the cornerstone of all feminism. Had someone asked me to take a side, I would have found it difficult. I remember feeling entirely conflicted when during the course of a television debate on censorship, I met Mumed Khan, a sultry beauty best known for her gyrating and pouting to the camera. At one point, springing to her feet, she pointed to the short skirt riding up her torn thighs and proclaimed aggressively that this was the freedom women wanted. The age of draping women only in salad kameezes was over, she yelled to thunderous applause. As a young Muslim from a conservative Lucknow family, she had defied several norms and cultural assumptions. But in the process, had she just adopted an alternative stereotype where her freedom was to be defined by a camera traveling up to Berlin. So this is just a passage uh, from the book. And uh, thank you so much. And my guest today is somebody who I believe has rewritten a lot of the old rules in the film industry. Not just that, she is refreshingly candid, she is not politically correct, and she speaks her mind. And over and above all that, her film Queen, according to me, is absolutely inspirational for young women who are looking to break free from old shackles. So thank you so much, Kangana Ranaut. Let's welcome uh, Kangana to this evening. Oh, hi, good evening, everyone. Thank and congratulations. Thank you. I want you to talk a little bit about your own journey from being a small town girl in Himachal Pradesh to getting to this point. From growing up in a family where you have quite openly admitted that your family 
was more favorably disposed to, towards your brother and in some ways openly discriminated against you to the point that one day you decided you were going to run away from home. Um, I think this kind of discrimination exists even today and uh, uh, I won't say there was anything unusual about my childhood but um, I actually I, I, I appreciate the fact that today we talk so much about women empowerment and I don't know how much of difference it's making but I think somewhere children who are growing up and women who are um, you know, going to be now gen next and their schools and their teens they at least to understand there's something wrong in being discriminated as opposed to us who growing up did see it as something which was wrong like I thought that it's a matter of fact that uh, being a girl child uh, is a liability on our parent and you felt like a liability? Yes, and because there was, there was no other uh, perspective that we had growing up. Um, I, I felt that it's fair for my parents to feel that uh, taking care of a girl child, because like, these conversations were everyday things, you know, that you uh, raise a child and you invest so much in her education and and then she goes about to you know, basically take care of someone else's house and there's so much dowry that you have to so it's basically not a very good scenario for them and uh, as, as opposed to a, a son who just brings, a, who brings another person to work at uh, their houses or you know, and brings uh, a lot of money along with other gifts for the families this, this is how actually middle class families feel you know, who struggle to make the ends meet for them those gifts the girl is a yeah.